In this video, we're going to look at the second test prep that you have for test number three. So, uh, the directions for number one, make sure you always pay attention to the, to the directions to see what the problem is asking you to do or telling you to do. Given the following functions, find the derivatives. Now, this section is literally about using the right tool for the right job meaning that you always want to examine the expression or the function to determine what is the smartest, most efficient strategy to use to find the derivative. So when I use my math eyes and I look at this function, the first thing I see big picture is I see a quotient because I have a numerator and a denominator. So one strategy I could use would be the quotient rule. And if I did it correctly, I would get it right. However, that's probably, well, it's, I can tell you for a fact, that's not the most efficient method in this strategy, for, for a, not the most efficient strategy for this particular function. So instead, I'm going to um, simplify this fraction so I can take the one fraction and make it into three fractions with the same denominator. So this would become 5x squared over x plus x to the one-half power. This is just all algebra and, and fraction work. Still in the rewrite fa phase, so I'm going to simplify each fraction. The first fraction simplifies to be 3x squared. The second fraction simplifies to be 5x. And the third fraction simplifies to be x to the negative one-half power. Now, bear in mind that this is still f of x. I have not found the derivative. So when I find the derivative after that simplification, it looks like I'm just going to be able to use the power rule for each term. So the derivative of 3x squared will be or is 6x. The derivative of 5x is 5. And the derivative of x to the negative 1 half power is negative 1 half x to the negative 3 halves power. Decrease the power by 1. So again, I could have used the quotient rule here, but that is not the most efficient strategy. So always look for the most efficient strategy to save time and effort. All right, I'm going to clear the screen and go to number two. Now in number two, when I use my math eyes again to take a look and examine that function, I again see a quotient. Um, however, it's different from number one. Notice in number one, I had a monomial denominator, and I could take that um, fraction and break it apart. I could break this fraction apart here, but I don't think it would do me a whole lot of good. So in this case, I'm actually going to use the quotient rule. I'll do this over here on the left-hand side. So when I find the derivative, the quotient rule is, of course, down. So that is x squared plus 2x d up times 5 minus up, which is 5x plus 1, d down, which is 2x plus 2, over down down. So that's x squared plus 2x quantity squared. As far as cleaning that up, I'm going to distribute the 5 into the first term. So that'll give me 5x squared plus 10x. Um, I'm going to write the minus in a parenthesis. I'll save the distribution of the negative for last. So I'll get 10x squared. Um, and that'll give me, when I multiply here, that'll give me 10x. That'll give me 2x for a total of 12x. And 1 times 2 is 2. Okay, so now I can distribute the negative and combine like terms. Make sure you distribute the negative to all three terms. Um, oh, i got to get my denominator over, down, down. So that's x squared plus 2x quantity squared. y prime, when I collect my like terms, I'll get 5x squared minus 10x squared makes negative 5x squared. 10x minus 12x gives me negative 2x, and distributing the negative to the 2 gives me minus 2 over the quantity of, notice that I am not squaring that um, denominator out. I'm going to leave it as a quantity squared. So that's my derivative. Now the next thing that this problem tells me to do is to write the equation of a tangent line. So whenever I see that I have to write the equation of a line, I'm going to begin with my target, which is point-slope form of the equation. 
I need a slope, I need an x number 1, and I need a y number 1. So x number 1 is given right here at x equal to 1. And to find the corresponding y value that goes with that, I'm going to substitute 1 back into the original function. So if I substitute 1 in the numerator, that'll give me 5 times 1 is 5 plus 1 is 6. If I substitute 1 into the denominator, I get 1 plus 2 is 3, and 6 divided by 3 is 2. So now I have my x and my y value. The slope is going to come from my slope generator, which is over here on the side. So I'm going to substitute 1 here, 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 and here. So let me carefully do that arithmetic. Um, I'm trying to find a place to do it. So that'll give me negative 5 in the numerator, minus 2, minus 2. In the denominator, I will have 1 plus 2 is 3, and 3 squared is 9. Five, negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7, minus 2 is negative 9. So that's negative 9 over 9, which is negative 1. I'm going to substitute everything into its place. So I have y minus 2 is equal to the slope of negative 1 times x minus 1. And the last thing I'm going to do is get y by itself. Plus 2. If you're struggling with writing the equation of the tangent line, make sure that you don't just watch this video and think you got it. Make sure you go back and do it to make sure you can produce the equation of that tangent line. Even though it's an Algebra 1 skill, a lot of calculus students struggle with that. All right, let's go on to number 3. I'm going to clear these annotations. I'm going to clear them. There they go. So in number three, we're back to our derivatives and we're always looking for the most efficient right tool for the right job. So in the first term, the first term is theta times tangent theta. So the first thing that I spy is a product. So that term is going to need the product rule. The second term is five theta and that's just going to need the power rule. So f prime of theta, theta is just my variable. I'm going to do my product rule work over here on the side. So there's theta, there's tangent theta. The derivative of theta is 1. The derivative of tangent theta is secant squared theta. So we're going to have the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, and we're going to add. So that will give me theta secant squared theta plus tangent theta. All of that is the derivative of the first term. So now that we have been alerted by my dog, let's find out the derivative of the second term. So right here we have 5 theta, and the derivative of 5 theta is going to be found by the power rule, so I just get minus 5. So that is the derivative of f. In number 4, uh, remember, we're looking for the right tool for the right job. Um, I see a quotient, first of all, and I would always ask myself, can I simplify this quotient? I could do a rewrite. I could bring the x to the one-half power to the numerator and then use the product rule if I want to. Um, I don't think that makes the problem that much easier. That's really part of the analysis is deciding which method you think is the most efficient. So in this case, the only thing I'm going to do is I am going to rewrite that denominator with a power of one half, and now I'm going to do the quotient rule. So y prime is down, d up, and the derivative of cosecant, it's a co, so the derivative is going to be a negative, so there's my negative, and the derivative of cosecant x is cosecant x cotangent x. You must have that memorized. That's down d up, and then minus up cosecant x, d down times one-half x to the negative one-half power over down down, which is x to the one-half squared. Now, as far as cleaning, there are lots and lots and lots of things that you actually could do, uh, like moving negative powers to the denominator. But at this point, this is about what I would expect you to do if you're in my class in terms of cleaning. Maybe later on there might be a greater expectation, but for now this would be okay. 
Yes, there are things that could be factored out in the numerator. And like I said, we could do something with the negative powers. But for now, that would be perfectly fine on an assessment. Moving on to number five. Number five. In number five, um, again, I see a product. Now there are, and when, when I see that product, again, a lot of this is about analyzing. I could distribute the e to the x here, and I could distribute the e to the x here. So the question I have to ask myself is, would that make this an easier or um, less cumbersome problem? Well, if I distribute the e to the x to the first term, I get 5x squared e to the x, and I still have a product. Now, the second term is no longer a product, but the first term is. So in my mind, I think I'm just going to leave it as is, and I'm going to find the derivative as the original product of 5x squared plus 7 times e to the x. So I'm going to go over here on the right-hand side, and I'm going to do my, here's my first factor, 5x squared plus 7. My second factor is e to the x. Derivative is 10x. Derivative is e to the x. First derivative second, second derivative first. So my derivative, f prime of x, is equal to, um, I could distribute the e to the x again. It, I don't know that it makes it better, so I have first derivative second plus second derivative first. You could distribute the e to the x. You don't have to distribute the e to the x. This would be perfectly fine. Let's see what we have next. Number six, read carefully. Reading is the most important thing. The following position function represents the path of a particle moving along a horizontal line. So we have this particle and it's moving along a horizontal line, probably going in a back and forth motion like that. The name of this function is x of theta. So remember, oops, change colors, that this is a position function. X is measured in meters, and theta, which would be the time, is measured in seconds. A, find the velocity function. So that's just another command to find the derivative. So x prime of theta, which could also be called v of theta, instant velocity. First term is the power rule, so 6 theta. Second term, the derivative of secant theta, is secant theta tangent theta. Got to know those trig derivatives from memory. Part B, find the acceleration function. So now we're going to do the second derivative of theta, I mean of x, or the first derivative of velocity, which will take me to acceleration. First term right here, derivative of 6 theta is 6. That was easy. The second term is a product secant theta, tangent theta. So I'm going to put my subtraction in a parenthesis, and I will have, I'll come over here and do this on the side like a lot of you like it. So I have secant theta, tangent theta. Derivative of secant theta is secant theta, tangent theta. Derivative of tangent theta is secant squared theta. So first derivative second, second derivative first, and then we add. Secant, secant theta times secant squared gives me, change colors back to purple, gives me secant cubed theta plus p for product, p for plus. Multiplying secant theta times tangent theta gives me secant theta tangent squared theta. I can distribute the negative and drop the parentheses if I want to. I'm not sure it makes a ton of difference. Letter C, is the particle traveling to the left or to the right? Well, we talked about this in class. If we want to know direction of a particle and we do not have a graph, velocity is our friend. So we want to know the sign of velocity, because remember the sign of velocity indicates direction, at theta equal to pi. So I'm going to substitute pi into the velocity function. So v of pi, go back up to part a, is 6 times pi, which is 6 pi, minus secant pi 
tangent pi. And I have to know if that's positive or negative. So I'm going to simplify that. So that would be secant pi minus. Now remember, uh, secant is 1 over cosine of pi. The cosine of pi is 1, and 1 over 1 is 1. So I have uh, 1 times tangent th pi is sine of pi over cosine of pi. The sine of pi, the y value at pi, is 0, and the cosine is negative 1. So that's going to be 0, which gives me 6, six pi. 6 pi is greater than 0. So I don't have room to write a sentence, but um, well, I'll, I'll fit it in here. I would say the particle, it's kind of sloppy, sorry. Particle is moving um, to the right because V of pi equal six pi which is greater than zero. Or you could say the velocity at pi is positive. All those would suffice for justification. All right, let me clear the screen here and get some of this stuff out of the way, and let's go on to number... Actually, I, uh, is that a different part? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure... All right, so you've been alerted by the dog again, so I'm going to clear those annotations since we're starting a new prompt. Number seven. Excuse me, the function h of t represents the length of Mr. Jernigan's hair in inches. So we have a mysterious function. t is weeks after getting a haircut. Explain the meaning of the following, be specific. So the first one is basically an algebra prompt. What is the meaning of h of 4 equal to 3? Well, it said back here that t is weeks after getting a haircut. So I'm just going to plagiarize those words four weeks after getting a haircut okay now what did that represent the length of mr jernigan's hair is three inches. So again, nothing calculus about that statement. That's totally an algebraic statement. Part B, now we go to a derivative. So I want to be really careful here. Many of you are getting doing a great job, but a few of you are still struggling. So some reminders. H prime, a derivative always modifies the preceding function. So h prime modifies or describes, modifies his word for describes, the preceding function. This is always true when you want to know if something is increasing, a quantity is increasing or decreasing. So if this is the case, if h prime modifies the preceding function, then h prime is going to describe or modifies h. So this is going to, h is going to actually the subject of the sentence. h prime is not the subject. h is the subject of the sentence. h prime is going to tell me what h, which in this case is the length of Mr. Jernigan's hair, is either increasing or decreasing. So when I go back over again to the given information, I see that the instant rate of change after two weeks is a positive 0.25. So what I know is that the length, this is the subject of my sentence, the length of Mr. Jernigan's hair, because the instant rate is positive, is increasing. So I'm going to say at two weeks, that's the first point in the rubric, after getting a haircut, that's still part of the first point. And where am I getting all these words? Right out of the prompt. At two weeks after getting a haircut, the subject of the sentence is Mr. Jernigan's hair is increasing. All right, so let's go back and analyze the points so far. The first point is the at two weeks after getting a haircut. Really, it's the, mainly it's the at two weeks. So the first point is, when did this happen? 
The next point is the subject of the sentence, which is Mr. Jernigan's hair. I should say the length of Mr. Jernigan's hair, um, to be more precise, because those are the words that they use. That's the second point. The third point is what is the hair doing? And in this case, increasing. So that's the third point. The fourth point is at a rate of, and then you're going to quote 0.25. I need the units, inches per week. So that is the fourth point in the rubric because I need to know why. How do you know this? And then you're going to say because h prime of 2 is positive or is greater than 0, and that is the fifth point. That is your writing formula for getting all the points on interpreting a derivative. All right, what's next? Number 8. One of Mr. Jernigan's calculus students is so thrilled, there's another quiz on motion, that she leaps from the ground into the air with a velocity of 64 feet per second. And you have been given the uh, standard form of a, a position of a free falling object. So here's that standard form. Letter A wants to know what is the average velocity of the student from zero to three seconds. Now pay attention to words. Words are really important. Words always matter. Average velocity. I talked about this in the first test review video. It's easy to mess this thing up. Average velocity. Velocity is the rate of change of position. So when we want the average velocity, average velocity, it's not the change in velocity, it's the change in position, so terminal position minus initial position over time. Change in position over change in time. Make sure that you spend some time thinking about that. Average velocity, change in position over change in time. Now I'm not going to calculate this, although we could, um, over here, I'm going to provide the uh, specific position function that we could use. Right now, I'm not horribly uh, concerned. I might be when they ask me some other questions about you typing into the calculator to get these numbers. V sub 0 is initial velocity, 64 feet per second, so plus 64t. Uh, she leaps from the ground, so the initial position would be zero. So this is the specific position function for the student leaping off of the ground. Um, so to calculate the average velocity, I would do, so average velocity is equal to terminal position at three seconds minus initial position at zero seconds over three minus zero. The units are, remember, position is measured in this case feet, and time is measured in seconds. So that's just another confirmation and a reminder that, yes, I did calculate average velocity. Letter B, what is the instant velocity? So now we're talking derivative because we're, we see the word instant, and I have my position function over here. So we're going to find instant velocity by finding the derivative, so s prime of t is v of t. The derivative is negative 32t plus 64. And then I would take and substitute 2 into time. So neg uh, 2 times negative 34 is negative 64 plus 64 would give me 0 feet per second. So evidently, um, the student has reached the top of their leap. So that would be the vertex of the parabola. So evidently, at two seconds, the student reaches um, the vertex or the top of her pathway. Letter C. What's going on letter C? Use calculus to determine when the student will reach maximum height. Well, we just actually did that, um, but if you had not done letter B, maximum height would be when, in this case, when the velocity 
is equal to zero. And we know that because this student is traveling along a parabolic path, and we know that based on letter B, that would occur at t equal to two seconds. If I did not know that, I would set negative 32t plus 64 equal to zero and solve that and get t equal to two seconds is when the student reaches their maximum height. Letter D. What is the, the word the uh, tells me instant, what is the acceleration when the student reaches the maximum height? So first I'm going to find acceleration by taking the derivative of my velocity function, which is right here, and the derivative of that velocity function is negative 32, um, which means that the acceleration is negative 32 feet per second all the time. So it's a, I mean, I can substitute two, but I'm going to get negative 32 feet per second. Be careful on the units squared. We've moved down to acceleration. Number nine, the instant rate of change of position is velocity. We've talked about that already. Number 10, the instant rate of change, the second derivative of position is the acceleration. We've talked about that already. And then lastly, the instant rate of change of velocity is also acceleration. All right, let's see what else we have. Turn, turn, turn. Ooh, number 12, really important. Make sure you spend some time here and that you understand this. Don't just copy my work. Make sure you did this and you are checking. And if you didn't get them right, erase it and do it again. I promise you this is extremely important for your upcoming test and for your understanding of calculus. So here we go. Given below is the graph of a velocity function. I always like to write it on here to keep my mind focused. Particle traveling along, those particles like to travel on horizontal, horizontal and vertical paths. The particle begins at the y-axis. Now remember, this is not the path of the particle, it's the velocity of the particle. On what intervals is the particle traveling left? So I have to stop and engage my brain and remember, okay, what do I look for on a velocity graph for particle movement? I'm looking for the sign. Since the particle, I want the particle to move to the left, I'm looking for when the sign of velocity is negative below the y-axis. So velocity is negative in this purple zone. So I would say in point zero to four, open, and the units are seconds. B, particle traveling to the right. Well, we're doing the same thing. We're looking for the sign of velocity, and we're looking for positive velocity above the y-axis. So positive velocity, positive velocity, and that is from open four all the way to, I believe that's 10, 9, 10. Um, the graph may go on or whatever. I'm not, you could, if you said infinity, I don't think I would take any points off because it does not say the graph specifically stops at 10. Particle stationary. Again, mainly it's, it's decoding what these words are telling you. So stationary means the particle is at rest, no movement, which really means the velocity is zero. Velocity is zero at zero, at four, and at 10. So particle is stationary at t equal to uh, zero seconds, t equal to four seconds, I'm running out of space, and t equal to 10 seconds. Next question. Particle traveling slowest. Well, guess what? You can't travel slower than resting. You can't travel slower than velocity zero. You can't travel slower than stationary. So these three answers just get, it's just a different way of asking the same question. Slowest. Next question. When is the particle traveling the fastest? Well, remember that velocity indicates two quantities. It indicates speed and direction. So the fastest would be 
the greatest magnitude or greatest distance of the velocity graph away from the x-axis. In other words, give me a second to erase my coloring on this graph. So I'm looking at the graph and I'm looking at the velocity graph to see when is that graph, when does it have its highest and lowest y values. So I notice a low y value at, let's change that to a brighter color. I notice a low y value at 2. I notice a high y value at 5. And those two seem to be either the lowest or uh, the lowest or the highest. Now I'm going to compare them. So this is down 1, 2, 3, 4. So I have a low of 4 versus a high of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the particle is traveling the fastest at t equal to 5 seconds. Letter G is another one that students often, um, if you're not careful, you'll make a mistake. So think before you act. That's true in a lot of things, in everything. So I'm looking for acceleration to be negative. So I have to think, I have a velocity graph. I'm, what's the relationship between acceleration and velocity? Hopefully you're answering that in your head. Acceleration is the slope of velocity. So really, what I'm looking for is when is the slope of the velocity graph negative, which means the velocity graph would be decreasing. Wherever the velocity graph decreases, the slope of that graph is negative, meaning the acceleration is negative. So the velocity graph is decreasing, 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 decreasing. The velocity graph is decreasing, 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 decreasing. And so in the blue zone, so right from here to here, if I can color, and from here to here, the acceleration is negative. So that would be from 0 to 2, and again from 5 to 10. Oh, close, if I'm, if I'm assuming that the graph ends there. That's a bracket. Lastly, um, we are looking for what is the acceleration at t equal to 7? Interesting. So remember, acceleration is slope of velocity. So another way to ask the same question would be, what is the slope of the velocity graph at t equal to 7? The slope of the velocity graph at t equal to 7. I'm getting rid of this stuff right here. All right, we're focusing at t equal to 7, which is right here. And so we want the slope. Now, fortunately, that sits on a line segment. So from so here, from here to here is a line segment. So all I need to do is rise and run. So I'm going to fall one, two, three, four, five. That's a fall of five, negative five. A run of one, two, three, four, five. So I have a fall of negative 5, a run of 5. So the slope at negative 7 is negative 1, or the acceleration, I'm sorry. Uh, the units, I already forgot, were we in meters? Were we in feet? Did it say particle traveling along a horizontal path? It does not say the linear units. So it would either be feet per second, centimeters per, uh, squared, feet per second squared, meters per second squared, something per second squared. All right, let's see what else we have. All right, so this is more test prep that we're going to do and prepare you for in class. Um, so I don't think I'm going to do the video on that right now. So hopefully you'll use this to help yourself get ready for your test.